So welcome everyone to the webinar. We'll just wait a couple of minutes to start in order to let everyone into the room. So we'll start in a minute or so. Thank you. So thank you everyone for joining us here today for this webinar on the empty library, the importance of finding solutions to under to do unsustainable ebook markets around the world. My name is Stephen Weiber. I'm Director of Policy and Advocacy at the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. And we're very proud to be working alongside our colleagues at LIBA, the Association of European Research Libraries, and Spark Europe in order to organize this project, program as a whole, Knowledge Rights 21, and this webinar. I'll start with a couple of little bits of housekeeping. Um, first of all, importantly, this webinar is being recorded, so please be aware of this. Um, what we will do is we will record the presentations. We won't necessarily then publish the discussions afterwards, but we will be publishing the recording of the, the presentation subsequently and linking to it from our social media for Knowledge Rights 21 and from, the, and from our website. Um, Please also be aware that the way as set out on the website, as set out on the website, we will have a number of opportunities for you to ask questions. Firstly, after my brief presentation at the beginning about the program, its goals and how to get involved, but also after each of our speakers and then a final opportunity at the end to ask more general questions about the topics that have been raised. So with that, and in order to ask your questions, Please don't hesitate to use the questions and answers bot button that you will see at the bottom of the screen. You can submit your questions anonymously or with your name. You can also vote for other people's questions and that will mean that we see which are the questions that really interest, excite the number, biggest number of people. So to get on with it. Um, so to explain briefly what our goals are here today for this webinar. Firstly, it's so that you get an idea of what the Knowledge Rights 21 or KR21 program is, and you build up a sense of what opportunities there are for you to engage, to help achieve its goals, and for the program to help you to achieve your goals. Secondly, and this is going to be the bulk of the program, is exploring the challenges faced by libraries and acquiring, acquiring and giving access to eBooks, which is one of the key policy focus areas of this work. We're also going to be sharing experience of advocating how it is that libraries can actually make a difference, can mobilise, can actually really achieve things to raise awareness of issues that they are facing. And finally, it's about spreading the word. And one great way you have of spreading the word is through tweeting about this session or talking about it on social media. And if you're doing that, please don't forget to use the hashtag empty library as you have up on the screen right now. So to start, um, Going to give it's going to be a sort of fit 17 minutes or so presentation about the program so that you're aware as I said there'll be time for questions afterwards why knowledge rights 21 why get involved in this now a lot of thinking about this came from when we were involved in the discussions around the directive on copyright and the digital single market in the european union and we felt throughout that that libraries were very active but too often this incredibly rich experience that libraries have of working with copyrighted materials, of trying to work at, of working with copyright materials in order to support education, research, cultural participation. This experience wasn't necessarily being heard. The issues that libraries face when they try to provide this fundamental 
fundamental rights. And these are fundamental rights set out in the Universal Declaration. This was not being helped by the state of law, by the state of policy, by the state of practice in an increasingly digital world. Of course, the conversations about this program started before the pandemic, but in many ways have only been amplified, intensified by the experience libraries have had of moving to a digital only model of providing access. It's also driven by the fact that we're aware that advocacy is best and it's often most fun and it's certainly most sustainable when it's done as a team activity. Um, we want to try and make sure that across Europe and I'll make clear later that this isn't just a case of the European Union, but across Europe as a whole, in each country, we can count on a team of people, a group who can share burdens, share expertise, who have different skill types that they can bring together in order to bring these experiences, to highlight these library priorities, these library needs to government. So I said on the screen, it should be a team effort. And the final point is that there is unfinished business. There was a major European copyright reform that finally came into force in, in, in 2009. And this made some significant progress. We saw very helpful progress on text and data mining, on preservation, on education, on access to out of commerce works. These provisions aren't necessarily perfect, but they take us a fair way. However, they don't answer a lot of other questions and we'll come on to some of those later. So to, to combine, there's an important point here, there's policy progress to be made and in order to do this, we need to make sure that library voices are heard and that library voices really have impact on debates alongside those who are allied to libraries. In terms of the, the actual practical background, I think a key thing that I have to mention right now is that this project has been made possible thanks to the generosity of the Arcadia Fund. We're extremely grateful for this, uh, and this is actually really enabling us to do something more than had been possible before. It enables us to invest more in capacity building, in building evidence. It is, we hope, going to be something really transformational for the field in Europe and beyond. The programme runs provisionally until July 2024, so we're still pretty well at the beginning, so that's why it's a good opportunity to bring people in now. As highlighted, it's important to underline that this is not just a European Union project. The focus is on all Council of Europe countries. Clearly, as we'll mention later on, the European Union has a clear influence through trade agreements, through potential accession discussions, simply as an influencer, as a model that other countries follow. But to be clear, this is something that's focused on every country in Council of Europe, Europe, not just the 27 EU member states. The way the programme is run, and I apologise for the typo here, um, we have an independent policy committee made up of experts with experience in libraries, copyright and advocacy from across Europe, who are sort of shaping the pol policy direction of our work, giving insights, giving ideas, offering uh, and helping to act as ambassadors for the programme. We have a management committee that brings together the three of the Our Library Associations Act in Europe, LIBA, Spark Europe and IFLA. And we have a small programme secretariat which is working to help keep things moving along, help coordinate the support, provide the support, and of course, organize webinars like today. Finally, do take a look at our website if you haven't already, knowledgerights21.org. So to give an idea, I think I'd like to say that there are three main pillars, three main areas of work in this. The first one, and it comes back to that first point about how do we build capacity? How do we make sure that libraries everywhere are able to marshal their ideas, to go out to government, to really convince governments to seek the changes that they need in order to work effectively in the 21st century. And we do this primarily through work to identify and then subsequently to support national networks of libraries and library allied groups. These are varied. We know that in some countries there are already excellent connections between libraries, organizations like Wikipedia, Creative Commons, broader digital rights groups, we know that many countries have library associations which themselves have copyright committees or legal committees that focus on these issues, but that's not the case anywhere. And so we really want to provide that boost, provide that support to set up the co coordination, to make things happen, to draw on the collective strengths of all those who are looking for knowledge reforms. In particular, one thing that we will be looking to do is set up a network of regional coordinators, having people with the capacity to organize, to coach, to steer, to support the work of national networks. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but 
we're hoping that these will be a real game changer in enabling copyright advocacy and supporting copyright advocacy at the national level. We will also be supporting grants out to for activities at the national level that may not have been possible otherwise, but can again have a transformational impact in achieving this programme's goals. Finally, in order to support this advocacy, the programme is investing in developing the evidence base. We are conscious that often discussions around copyright are as much about philosophy and emotion as they are about hard facts. There's a huge fear of losing markets, of losing possibilities to do things. And many of these questions have not been subject to sufficient research so far to be able to say something meaningful. We'll be looking to fill that gap and by doing so provide advocates at the national level and at the Brussels level with tools, with materials that can really make a difference. The second big area of focus is around delivering concrete policy changes. Now, I talked earlier about there being unfinished business from the EU's copyright directive. It didn't cover everything. A one particular area it didn't cover was around library e-lending. Now, the situation faced legally is that while there is a, ju a judgment of the Court of Justice of the European Union that says that library e-lending, the lending of e-books, should be treated in the same way as the lending of physical books, this has yet to actually be implemented by any country. Furthermore, it leaves open some questions about the potential for contracts or for technological protection measures to be used to prevent libraries from carrying out this core centuries-old function, which has such an important role in allowing equitable access to information. In this area, what we're hoping to do is change things so we have a better deal for library lending. And this is through a mixture of, this is primarily through looking at how we can provide backstops. Now, we'll hear a lot more about this today, so I'm really not going to talk more about this. We have three far more expert people than me who can talk about it. So listen in, take a look at the Knowledge Rights 21 website, which also has our policy paper on this topic in order to find out more. And of course, stay on the call. The second area that we're focusing on is the topic of contract override and technological protection measures. Now, contracts, it, this is closely linked to the fact that increasingly when libraries acquire content, it isn't done through an outright sale, as was the case with the book. Instead, libraries must sign a license for access. And this license can set out terms. It can decide, it can define whether a library is able to take advantage of some of the possibilities created by exceptions and limitations in the past. Now, this issue has been partially addressed, at least for EU member states and those who are covered by EU law, in the Directive on Copyright and the Digital Single Market that makes clear that, for example, text and data mining for research purposes, preservation, is not possible to contract out of these rights. However, these are just two particular areas. There are many more types of library activity which can potentially be made more difficult by contract terms. Things like document supply, things like internal library uses, and of course, lending. So there's very much a gap here, which some countries have looked to fill. Ireland is a fantastic example here, but others not. So we're looking to spread the importance, to spread the prevalence of provisions that make it clear that library exceptions and limitations should not be overridden by contract terms. Similarly, we're focused on the topic of technological protection measures. These are technological tools that can prevent libraries and users in general from taking advantage of the exceptions and limitations that exist in law. These measures are themselves protected by law. Removing them, circumventing them, sharing the means of removing or circumventing them it can be criminalized. It certainly comes with penalties attached. And of course, this is another way of undermining the intent of legislators, the goal of library exceptions and limitations to facilitate access to knowledge. Um, Again, this is an area that was tackled in the most recent directive, but only as concerns a number of areas, preservation and text and data mining, for example. But even then, there remain a lot of questions about how these work in practice, how to actually turn the guarantee in law into a guarantee in reality that no library, no library user should be prevented from, use, from, from supporting access to education, research culture, because of misapplied technological protection measures. We're also looking at the topic of flexible exceptions. We've certainly seen in the course of the pandemic that countries with a more flexible approach to copyright law 
was more based on principles rather than prescriptive explanations of what is and is not possible, have often fared far better. Libraries have, had it, have found it far easier to be able to continue to provide service to, to, to their users. They found it easier to continue to operate. Now, clearly this is an area where in Europe, we don't have so much examples, there are many examples so far, but there are really interesting examples out there from Singapore, from Sri Lanka, from South Korea, from Israel, from the United States that indicate what is possible. And so we're really looking to start that debate, start to promote this openness, this readiness to focus on a more principles based approach to defining copyright limitations and exceptions rather than that prescriptive approach. The fourth area, and we're getting very much onto the field of open access now, is to promote legislated secondary publishing rights. This is an area that LIBA in particular has been extremely strong on. This refers to the idea that regardless of a contract that a researcher signs with a publisher, if their work has been publicly funded, they should have the possibility to publish what they have done in an open access repository. It's a good way of trying to turbocharge, trying to accelerate the effort to make sure that the maximum possible volume of research is published immediately at open access, can benefit everyone, not just those who are lucky enough to be affiliated to an institution with a budget to acquire all of the journals that they may potentially want to need. And this sort of promotion of open access is also good for citizen science, for helping people who are working through public libraries, independent researchers to actually achieve their goals. Linked to that, and focus very much more on the on and the focus on the sort of practice side of things is the topic of rights retention. And this is our, this is the idea that when an author has completed their article, rather than signing away their entire copyright to the publisher, instead they give the publisher a license to publish. They allow they allow the publisher to publish their article in their journal, in their journal, but at the same time they retain their copyright and they therefore can also publish it open access. Again, there's a parallelism between the two, the legislative approach on secondary publishing rights and the practice approach focused on institutions, funders, publishers, and researchers themselves, importantly, around rights retention. Now, in each of these areas, we feel that there are possibilities to change the debate, to actually try and achieve things on the ground in a number of countries that will simply improve the situation for libraries and improve library's ability to achieve goals of, as set out in the as set out in the program mission as a whole, promoting 21st century access to education, research, and culture. A final pillar is around achieving change in Brussels. Now, clearly, as I've said at the beginning, Brussels is not the the, the EU does not cover all of Europe. However, clearly, the EU has a huge influence on what is going on elsewhere through accession discussions, through trade negotiations, through entities such as the European Economic Area, it does matter what happens in Brussels. And so through the programme, we're able to work to influence current EU legislation in relevant areas, work around research, work around education, work around the right to repair. We can get involved, we can promote programme goals, set the agenda that will then come down to the national level. We can also look to shape future policy agendas highlight the priorities that the next European Parliament, that the next European Commission should be taken forward as a priority in order to achieve key policy goals. Clearly, Brussels also has an important impact, as I said, on national policy discussions through the guidance it produces, through the reports, through the research that it carries out. These are key potential supports for the work of libraries in forming discussions, in forming advocacy. So if we can get involved in those, that benefits, that benefits libraries around the continent. And finally, of course, there's a potential to coordinate, to make sure that we can work, coordinate, work with members of the European Parliament and work at the national level to actually look for those opportunities, to find connections, to ensure that national MEPs are supporting priorities in Brussels, but in turn that they are taking back key messages around the goals of the programme back home. So coming towards the end of my slides, and just about within my time. Um, there are opportunities. I, I've hinted at a number of them so far, but I encourage you to think about these, to keep an eye on our website and our social media in order to, 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 to look out for the chances that there might be for you as individuals, as associations, as 
uh, as, as groups of people to get involved within Europe. A first point is that we are call, we have a current call for tender out, contracting out for work on contract override. So looking at the scope of contract override provisions in law in Europe, we'll soon have one focus on training and actually commissioning a training course in order to build skills across Europe, not just on copyright, because there's a fair amount of training about the specifics of copyright, but crucially bringing together copyright and advocacy. What do you need to know about copyright in order to be an effective advocate? What do you need to know about advocacy itself and how best to have an impact to build connections, to build sympathy, to build support, to build action? I apologize for the police. I promise they are not for me. I trust that they're not for me. Um, another area which I've mentioned previously is that we will be taking on regional coordinators. These will be people who give a day or so a week, who are contracted to work a day or so a week, in countries to support the work of networks, to add that extra dedicated capacity to really make the difference in advocacy, to invest in building the relationships, preparing materials, preparing roadmaps for national advocacy. We will be making a call for national grants in order to support national level research events. Again, things that may not have been possible otherwise, but we can really facilitate and can really have a big positive impact on the effectiveness of the advocacy of libraries and of library allied groups. And finally, because we do now have this capacity at the Brussels level, there's a new opportunity to make connections between the national and the Brussels level around copyright issues, around access to information issues, which we hope will support everyone in their work. So what we'll do is we'll come on to this later. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and simply throw open the floor to any questions that there might be at this moment. Um, we have budgeted until about half past for this, so I will have a look at the questions and answers that appear. So the first question that we have in, and I might ask our attendee to clarify this, but what is the work of the self-service station in this specific topic? Um, my understanding of the question is that we're talking about self-service stations within libraries. Um, I would admit, I think that this is a self-service stations. I, I probably haven't thought about this enough. I suspect this isn't, there's not so much of a copyright issue on this one. This is about the effective, you know, the good functioning of libraries internally, of managing workflow, of helping users get the easiest possible experience there. Um, there is a potential angle, of course, around questions around dedicated terminals and the degree to which users of libraries are forced to use dedicated library terminals in order to access resources, or are there better opportunities to access library resources at distance? Great, thank you. There's a separate question coming in, so I will, which I will read out. So. Ebooks as a digital medium seem particularly vulnerable to what seems to be an increasing risk of outages. Even just within the last two years, we have seen the pandemic related bankruptcy of at least one major supplier and also a global energy crisis. Is there scope within Knowledge Rights 21 for consideration of how to avoid or mitigate situations where books effectively stop working? This is a very good question. I think we've certainly seen the, the example of Dawson ERA during the pandemic was a telling one that libraries had bought access, but the state of the company, the failure of the company meant that libraries were faced with a huge amount of uncertainty about whether they'd continue to be able to access materials that they had already paid for um, until it was possible to work out that at least most of the content, until it was possible for other suppliers to take on most of this material. Now, I think this is a really key question. There's a key fundamental issue that we're looking at that is around the importance of digital ownership. And this appears as an issue potentially under eBooks. It appears as an issue around contract override and this key question of to what extent is only making material available through licenses really the way forwards? Do we need to look again at this question of whether libraries can actually really own copies of books, have, copy, have copies of electronic material, digital material on their own servers which of course takes away the risk of, which of course takes away the risk of, of, of things disappearing if the company itself disappears. These are questions for our policy committee, of course, but 
I think exactly this is really one of those underlying themes that will appear throughout the program. Um, clearly there's work going on as well around digital preservation, but again, even within the context of the European Direct on Copyright Digital Single Market, we have that open question that what about, can you preserve material that isn't in your permanent collection? Can you preserve material that has been licensed rather than being available permanently? A next question that's come up is, um, how can Knowledge Rights 21 solve the violation of national law and balance of open access and political topics around e-resources? Um, this is something that we are working on. Um, I, it, I think I would probably need a little bit more clarification about the reference to national law. If it means the risk that national law can be very easily ignored or overridden by contract terms, indeed, this is an absolutely core function on what we're doing. Certainly, we're also looking to people at the national level, people who have an understanding of the national debate and national discussions, who can then, who know what are the issues that get people interested how can we build up this narrative in favour of openness to everyone? Um, there's another question. Um, what about other types of digital materials? So the focus on ebooks is there because it has to take on a particular importance that will be covered in the rest of this webinar in terms of ebooks being a core part of obviously what public libraries do, but also a really core cool part in many disciplines of what academic libraries do. And so that ebook, I think the focus on the ebook as a specific issue is there. This is not to exclude other forms of digital content. The digital journal space is well covered, but clearly when we're talking about secondary publishing rights and rights to retention, this is a different, these are the, the, this applies not only to books, but also obviously to articles as well. Um, I'm just going down the list. Um, there's a question about microfilms digitalization will not be included. Um, I think this is an area, I think we have to be clear within this program that we have a number of areas and already five policy areas, plus the support of the capacity building at the national level is, is a big amount of work. There are of course, many library associations, including IFLA, that do a lot of work in general around digitization how to make this happen. Clearly the digitalization of microfilms is something that is covered at least in some countries by preservation exceptions. We would certainly of course encourage other countries to do exactly the same and indeed promote the general concept at the World Intellectual Property Organization that a library should be able to digitize any materials it has in the format using the technology that's most appropriate and is most effective. I'm just going to take one more question that I can see in the chat, um, which is, um, are academic publishers squeezing out libraries with moves to a business to consumer, Netflix-like textbook subscription services? Um, that's a, a good question that's being set up. That is, indeed a, that is indeed a major concern that we are ending up in a situation where if businesses, if publishers only work to serve individuals, we risk coming back to recreating the equity issues that justify why we have libraries there in the first place. A key function of libraries remains to exist in order to make sure that a lack of resources and your access to education, to research, to culture should not be conditional on your resources. This is a universal human right, not a luxury. That's what libraries are there for. If libraries are squeezed out because of the promotion of B2C type models, this is a problem. This is something that we need to stand up and look at in Europe, but also around the world. This isn't a purely European issue. OK, I, I'm, I'm going to stop answering because we've hit half past two. And, and given that I'm chairing, I feel that we, we should stick to time. Um, so what I wanted to do is now we're going to go into the, the, the substantive element of this programme. And we're going to hear from three great speakers on the topic on topics linked to e-lending. And as I said at the beginning, the goals that we have for this are underlining what's happening, the challenges that are faced, but also really highlighting what libraries are doing. Some of the really great examples of how libraries are already standing up and making noise, are sharing evidence and are calling for action. So first, we're very lucky to have Cahal McCauley, 
who is the university librarian at Maynooth University and is also president of the Library Association of Ireland and is also an active member of the team organising the IFRS conference this summer in Dublin. So, and Cahal is going to talk about the ebook SOS campaign in Ireland. So with that, I'd like to hand over to you, Cahal. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. And I'm just going to share screen now and hope this will all go well. Can you all see that? Yes, that's working. Well, thank you very much and good afternoon. As Stephen said, my name is Cahal McCauley and I am president of the Library Association of Ireland and University Librarian at Maynooth University, which is a university of about 17,000 students just outside of Dublin in the east of Ireland. Um, before I begin, I want to thank Knowledge Rights 21 for arranging today's seminar, and I think it's particularly appropriate that their first seminar is about developing a more sustainable approach to ebook provision. I also want to thank uh, Johanna, Rachel and Caroline and the ebook SOS team in the UK, um, and you'll hear more about them later because they really have been so helpful um, with getting the Irish campaign underway and up and running. I'm going to talk about the campaign in Ireland and the background to it and what we have done to date and what we plan to do in the future. And I'm afraid that I believe you will recognize many, if not all of the problems with ebooks that we have experienced in Ireland, but I hope that you will be encouraged to get involved in addressing these problems and in campaigning for a better, fairer approach to ebook provision. So before I go any further, I just want to say, I mean, I am a big fan of ebooks. Um, and most of us are very familiar with the advantages around accessibility, portability, the usefulness, for example, for visually impaired users and so on. And as, of course, illustrated by this graph of public library ebook lending uh, in early 2020 and 21, and you know, they prove themselves to be invaluable during the most difficult days of the COVID-19 pandemic, when physical libraries were closed to users and citizens were limited in what they could do as various forms of lockdown swept the world. In Ireland, in academic libraries and in public libraries, ebook usage soared by more than 250% during the pandemic, and libraries rushed to invest in them. And the Irish government, government announced two separate rounds of additional funding to feed the demand during the pandemic. Publishers also made a vast amount of content freely available, as Stephen mentioned, uh, temporarily, as public and academic libraries struggled to pivot to almost exclusive online uh, service provision. Ironically, however, this sudden surge in demand exacerbated many librarians' concerns about the many serious problems associated with ebooks, especially the current and developing models of ebook provision and some of the questions at the end touched, touched on this. So I guess some of the really serious problems that we're concerned about uh, how they're currently provided or not, and we'll come to that in a second, is first of all, because sometimes they're not provided at all. I mean, sometimes as few as 10% of academic titles are available to universities in electronic format. Um, you find a, a source that for a 2018 Scannell study um, and public libraries face similar challenges. We actually can't make uh, certain titles available. For example, in Ireland, public libraries do not get uh, ebooks from Hachette or Amazon. They just don't make them available. And this lack of availability or provision has many serious implications for collection development and undermines the library's core mission. Then if you move on, and even if the ebook is available, it is almost always more expensive and frequently up to 20 times more expensive. And there's often little to justify this price differential. Of course, there are many examples of publishers really using and taking advantage of the technology effectively, but there are also many examples of where a so-called ebook is simply a PDF of the print version with no value added. And also the pricing of ebooks does not reflect the many savings the publishers uh, benefit from when they produce ebooks on producing and transporting and so on uh, physical copies. Even if you do decide then that you can accept the original cost, price rises are common, uh, they can be very sudden, and they can, and they, at least to us, appear very arbitrary. And for example, a recent example from the late end of last year was the 2020, uh, the announcement by Pearson of uh, price increases up to 400 and uh, 500%. So eye-watering. Um, I'm sure it's the same in your countries as it is uh, in Ireland at the moment. There's a lot of discussion around the cost of living and the increase in the cost of things like fuel and food and so on because uh, of, of various issues around the world. But still, those percentage increases are nothing in the order of the kind of increases that we're frequently asked to accept in relation to um, ebooks. Another issue, even if you, uh, you get past those prices and cost increases, is libraries increasingly don't own ebooks but have to license them. And this alone fundamentally changes a library's relationship with its collection. And to make matters worse, 
these licenses uh, are often confusing, restrictive and very volatile. And unfortunately, some of us will be familiar with the concept, for example, of literally exploding licenses. Um, and then the other thing which is just mentioned there in the questions uh, is the current strategies of many publishers suggest that these problems are only going to get worse with the growth of new business models like the e-textbook model uh, often seen in academic and special libraries. Uh, we had an example at an Irish seminar where it's described about the impact of that in, in a law firm. And this model is expensive, exclusionary, it restricts inter interdisciplinary research, which is what we're all being asked to encourage now in our academic institutions, cross team use if it's in a work or professional environment, and it's simply unsustainable. So all, they were the main factors that led to us um, feeling that we really need to do something about it in Ireland. And as I mentioned earlier, we were really inspired by our colleagues in the UK, and we, I'm very pleased to say, continue to work close with them as recently as last night. I was in touch with Johanna about some work that we're doing in this area. Um, but in Ireland, myself and two other senior library colleagues, Stuart Hamilton, the head of Libraries Ireland, who effectively lead public libraries in, in Ireland, and Marion Higgins is a county librarian uh, for a county called Kildare, happens to be my, my home county. We came to dis discuss what we could do about these issues around the same time that the ebook e e SOS campaign was really taken uh, off in the UK. So we met with Johanna, uh, who, as I said, has been an inspirational and collegial colleague, and that's where the Irish uh, campaign really kicked off. So first of all, we should call for action. And at the end of my presentation, I'll have links to, to some of these uh, resources where we on what we call an electronic content crisis facing libraries and library users. And working together, the call was signed by four key representative groups the Library Association of Ireland, uh, who represent librarians and li libraries in Ireland, the Irish Universities Association Librarians Group, the Technological and Higher Education Association Librarians Group, and the Consortium of National and University Librarians. So this was an unprecedented cross-sectoral move, which underlined the move of the, the level of concern in, in, in Irish libraries about these issues. And this cross-sectoral dimension from the outset is an interesting difference uh, from the UK campaign, which started out with a focus on academic libraries, but this has changed recently and uh, you'll see on the ebook SOS uh, campaign's website in the UK, many examples now of other sectors have joined in. We followed up the call, again, uh, uh, taking the, the lead of the uh, UK campaign by gathering examples of the kind of issues we were concerned about and, uh, and, and, and collecting data to support that. Again, I was pleased to hear that Stephen mentioned that that can be very important. And uh, our data, very much correlated with the UK data, found that 20 times, ebooks are often 20 times more expensive uh, than the print equivalent, and generally three to 10 times more expensive. An interesting finding is that the data suggests that the largest multipliers are applied by the large international publishers rather than small local Irish publishers. Then during March and April 21, uh, ahead of planned meetings with the Irish government, uh, we engage in a concerted social media campaign. And again, you can see in the top right hand side of, uh, of my slide, some of the graphics, and you'll see one on the next slide as well, that were um, prepared and used in that campaign. And again, uh, the base graphic was, was supplied by our colleagues in the UK, and we added in local information and local logos and so on. Um, uh, and then in May 21, we had a series of meetings with key officials in Irish government departments. Uh, and agencies, including the Department of Rural and Community Development, who would look after public libraries, the Competition and Consumer Protection Commission, whom we felt might be interested in some of the price rises and uh, some of the terms and conditions that we're subjected to, the Higher Education Authority and the Department of Further and Higher Education, who clearly work with us in the uh, university sector, about our concerns. And we have continued since then to brief these officials regularly, and they've attended many of our events and there is a growing understanding of the issues and how they are connected to other government objectives. I think that's a very important point to link them to other government objectives around things like open access, value for money, active citizenship and inclusivity. And throughout 2021, we engaged a number of media interviews and briefings with everyone from student groups to national newspapers. So a very, very active uh, campaign making noise really about this uh, issue. In July 2021, the broader um, uh, ebook SOS campaign was a central element of the launch of Knowledge Rights 21, and we'd like to see that. And then just afterwards in August 21, IFLA formally in, in endorsed the campaign. And again, we benefited from that. Locally in Ireland in January 2022, we organized a booked out seminar with, seminar with speakers from a range of sectors in education and public libraries, law libraries, and so on, about how these problems are impacting libraries. And, and, and we had speakers from the UK, Germany, and the US to hear about how they were addressing these problems in their countries. 
The really pleasing thing about the seminar, apart from the, uh, how popular it was, is that we had key government officials that we've been briefing throughout the previous six months and other industry representatives attend, which demonstrated that they were aware of and listening to what we were saying about ebooks. In addition to highlighting the issues, a key objective of the seminar was developing international links with the UK, US, Germany and others. These links are especially important for many reasons, but particularly because Ireland is a small market, and I hope that gives encouragement to some of you if you're from smaller countries. And we know that what we do is like to have a limited impact, particularly on the larger publishers. Um, but if many countries were to work together, then this would change the dynamic, especially for EU members, as we believe it is likely that many of the solutions, the issues, concerns will be developed and, 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 and come forward at the EU level. Another key objective of the seminar was to get the campaign to the next level, and we invited senior colleagues from across the Irish libraries who attended the seminar to a strategy session in the afternoon afterwards. And this has now led to us working with a broader coalition of senior library colleagues from across the sectors in the run-up to IFLA WLIC 2022 and beyond, which we see as an opportunity to again, raise the profile of the campaign uh, within Ireland. So what are we going to do next? Well, building on the, I suppose, laying the groundwork during those first uh, 12, 18 months, we're now hoping to have a broader, uh, more structured campaign. So I guess we see it kind of moving beyond the uh, startup phase. And uh, we've developed a work plan with key areas to include things like awareness raising, advocating for government and state action on the issue, uh, feeding into uh, advocacy for EU action, uh, support for alternatives, including things like controlled digital lending and the use of open educational researchers, uh, commissioning research into some of the challenges and problems that we're facing, and also targeting all this information uh, in our rising that activity at key constituencies uh, like uh, politicians, uh, the public, um, and uh, other decision makers and funders that we have to really make sure are informed about these issues. Uh, a very important thing that we will be looking for will be funding to sustain and develop the campaign and also to work to maintain its momentum because it is an important point that for many of us who've worked through the transition, for example, from print to electronic journals in the 1980s, 1990s, and the recent move to more uh, different types of open access publishing, the current situation is in, in relation to ebooks is familiar. And then as now publishers resisted change for many years, but when it did come, it can come very, very quickly and you have to be ready to respond to it. And I suspect the same pattern will be repeated here. One thing is for sure that the situation won't change uh, any quicker if we don't advocate for it. But it is important that, that, that we have patience as well because it is not a sprint, it's more likely to be not quite a marathon, certainly a longer distance uh, run than a sprint. Um, a key objective, I guess, of today's uh, session is also to encourage you to think about what you can do. And I appreciate everyone is really busy and certainly if it's the same in, in, where you're working as it is in Ireland after COVID, the pace of work and activity seems to really have accelerated. I think maybe people are trying to make up for lost time and so on. But you know, if the very least you can do is to sign the letter uh, that the UK campaign have, I would encourage you to do so. They're very close if they haven't quite passed the 5,000 signatures mark. So that'd be a wonderful milestone to, to help them to get over. And that would send a very powerful message about the level of concern um, that there is uh, around ebooks. Um, if you are keen then uh, to consider doing more, well, as Stephen and I have mentioned, it would be really important then to gather uh, data and examples to support your concerns. This is really important for two, two main reasons. Firstly, it is, it, is, it is important that we don't be perceived as just moaning or, or, or giving out without sort of any evidence. Policymakers will want evidence and the publishers, you can be sure, will be well prepared. So it is important that we have that evidence. And secondly, I can speak from firsthand experience that the impact of having good data is really palpable. When we talk to our civil servants through the price rise, the prices and terms conditions that we discovered from our data collection and so on, they were really stunned and were immediately engaged and realized that there was an issue here that needed attention. It really is important that you use that data also to raise awareness locally and nationally within appropriate organizations, uh, library ones included, because again, many library colleagues uh, who maybe work in different aspects of libraries on won't be aware of some of these issues so don't take that for granted but also particularly obviously non-library which are local authority if you're a public uh, public librarian uh, within various structures within your university like academic council for example and so on your professional organization like your library association and of course essentially for most of us because we would tend to be uh, at least have some government funding with the various relevant government um, 
agencies. We all know how powerful social media is and it really is important to, uh, if you are active, doing all the things that I've mentioned that, you know, where possible, if you're on Twitter and so on, that you'd use the uh, ebook SOS uh, hashtag to uh, both alert others to it, but also to get others to, to help you and to support you. And it really is important, as I said, to get colleagues involved uh, internationally. And today, hopefully, can be the start of that. We were so lucky, as I said, to have the support and advice of our UK colleagues. And I'm sure they would be just as keen to help others. And we certainly would be able to help you too. It's part of why I'm here today. And apart from the support, support aspect, as I mentioned earlier, I suspect the solution will also um, arise as a result of international cooperation. We say in Ireland, there is no strength without unity. So it really, really is important, as Stephen said, that we get in touch and that we work together on this really, really important issue. Um, I couldn't have an opportunity like this without um, plugging the fact that the IFLA World Live and Information Congress is taking place in Dublin in July this year. Uh, my One of my first meetings this morning was about that, and I'm happy to tell you that we have over 1,400 delegates already registered, so it's going to be a, a huge success, particularly given the circumstances. But apart from it just being a plug, there is a satellite event just before uh, the, 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 the Congress itself about ebooks, so it really would be an opportunity to come and meet in person with colleagues, uh, like-minded colleagues about the issues, and that might be your route into getting involved in, 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 in trying to make a difference uh, to this very, very important issue. I mentioned earlier that uh, I'll give you some of the links and they'll be available here in terms of the kind, uh, some of the background to some of the information that I've been talking about today. And just to say uh, again, a huge thank you, Gurmila Mahogiv, for your kind attention uh, and to thank Knowledge Rights for the opportunity to speak. And I do hope that we get the opportunity to work together and to advocate for a fair and more sustainable approach to ebooks. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kahal. That was that was fantastic, and I think it's sort of it's really powerful. It's really I don't know, just as, I don't know, the sense of the learning process and the fact yeah. of trying so many different options, getting so many people involved, really bringing the library field together in order to advocate most effectively, to reach out most effectively. I think there's so much to learn from that, and as you were saying, it's great that you're here today sharing that sort of experience. And this is something we really hope we can do across Europe as part of this program. Um, I guess I, I was going to let you, I, I, I can witter slightly for a little bit, but I'd encourage you, Carol, to take a look at the, the questions to see if there's any in there that are, are, are sort of most, that jump out particularly at you as being, as being ones you want to sort of take on. I'm just, where we started now, so. Ebooks and it's so I'm sorry I see there one about when we say ebooks and digital audiobooks. Yes, we certainly are talking about both in the uh, in the Irish campaign. But I would have to say our main focus is on uh, ebooks, as in the print equivalent, the ebook equivalent of 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 print. I'm sorry, now the question just jumped there on me. Um, uh, I'll see one there. What about university outputs authored by your academic and teachers, such as academic books, practicalized textbooks? can we as institutions do our own content to present some of these issues? Well, I think Stephen touched on some of these issues. There's a couple of ways around that, you know, that we might approach this. One is obviously rights retention and secondly, publishing rights, which I think is a very important part of the campaign. But also as the questioner mentions, uh, we really think that OERs have, um, have, have a role as well. And one of the links that I uh, have included there, which I just realized when I post them into the chat, they didn't have the hyperlinks, so I will try to fix that when I'm not speaking next. Uh, apologies for that. But we do encourage that. But the important thing I would say is, and particularly I mentioned earlier, that one of the differences between our campaign and the campaign in the UK is from the outset, we've been about both the public and the academic uh, library sectors. And now we're branching into law and health and different solutions won't be applicable in some of those sectors. So the whole issue of OERs and right retention really isn't that relevant in terms of public libraries in the main, uh, but obviously important academic. And equally, there are other issues that the public libraries are, are uh, face, uh, which would be uh, which would be of, 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 of bigger concern to us. So I think there are going to be a few different uh, approaches required, and it won't be one size fits all. And for example, one issue I personally believe is I think publishers will have an important role to play in in in, in addressing solving these issues because no matter how um, many other alternative ways we have of producing content, you know, having those kind of processes and structures in place won't be an option for um, for, 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 for some libraries. So I think we have to bear that in mind as well. 
um, and that addresses another question there about the role of publishers. I mean, yes, publishers do have, have do have um, a role in this in this campaign. I think they do have to take a look at, uh, you know, we are their customers. Uh, we're, we're you know we're highlighting these uh, uh, issues around pricing and around the sustainability of that and around the licenses and. Um, in normal business terms, if your customers aren't happy and they have concerns about how you're doing your business, but well, then you would aim to address uh, those concerns. So I'd be hopeful that they would take uh, a positive and engaged attitude and be a bit more constructive than they might have been to date, uh, frankly. Um, I um, I agree with you about expensive subscriptions of e-resource. However, the platform will remove the material that's no longer available how can the platform be sustainable? Yes, I think these are some real issues. And it's not just, again, we had a really interesting example actually from the seminar that we had in, in, in Ireland in January, where the law firm, we make an example, they are subject to these strange practices as well. And often in law, the key thing is, well, when was the crime committed or when was the offence committed? You have to go back to that period and see what the law was. And if publishers have these practices of uh, taking down content arbitrarily, it actually causes real, really serious problems, apart from you know, what we might see in academic and public libraries, collection development issues, it actually impedes the businesses that are buying this content from them doing their work effectively. So I think we do need to look at those kinds of issues as well. Um, with the return to physical space and access to physical resources, are you starting to see a reduction in your e-loads? Um, well, and that's very interesting. I was talking to some colleagues, not specifically about this issue recently. What we are seeing is, certainly in academic libraries uh, and in public libraries in Ireland, there was a massive growth in device ownership and, uh, uh, and in Wi-Fi um, kind of connections during the pandemic as people had to work and, 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 uh, and so on at home. And we were wondering, would that lead to uh, a sustained shift from print E? But now, I don't know if some of you have seen, there's also some economic data emerging that one of uh, the responses to the cost of living increases I mentioned earlier from a lot of people is that uh, services like Netflix and so on are actually losing subscribers for the first time in their in, in their lives uh, as businesses because people are are cutting down if you like and what they see is non-essentials so I think it's a particularly hard at the moment to make that call because you have so many conflicting um, pressures on the one hand you people did sort of get used to working in a certain way the number of people who are now uh, you know using hybrid models and so on speaks to that but then also they're starting to experience these cost of living issues which uh, would seem to be around for at least a short to medium term, and they're having to respond to that as well. So I think it's hard; to, it's really hard to, to be definitive about that at the moment. Um, I'm conscious of the time now, Stephen. I mean, I can keep strolling and picking up on these. Uh, I think you, you, you've got you've got a minute more. So if, if there's any one more that you'd like to answer to, well, otherwise, there's more question on the role of the publisher. Will this include the distributors as well? In some cases, a book is less when buying directly from the publishers. But unfortunately, some publishers do not allow African countries in particular to buy directly from them. Well, I think we're all experiencing that, the use of third party vendors. And yes, sometimes the, ven the, 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 the vendors and the aggregators have to inform us about price increases that are coming uh, from the publishers. So that certainly is, is, is an issue. And it's related to the other one that I mentioned, which another question addressed earlier about the growth of e-textbooks models, uh, which is particularly concerning. So I think uh, distributors certainly do have a role to play. But it's pretty clear to me, at least in most cases, the big decisions are being driven at the publisher level. And then the aggregator then is, is basically following to the terms and conditions that they're that they are that has been applied to them. Because that, that 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 relates to the availability issue as well that I mentioned, you know, that quite often the aggregators aren't even being given the content to sell us, regardless of whether we think the price or the terms and conditions is are acceptable. So I guess I better leave it at that then, Stephen. But thank you very much, everyone, for all of your questions and interests. And I did have my contact details on my slides so if you do want to get in touch again uh, about something else please do thank you thank you and, and, and i would say and obviously cal's with us for the rest and we've planned for about 15 minutes at the end for general questions so if you have further questions for Cahal, either put them in the q a put his name on them and he may be able to respond in writing or we can approach them at the end once you've had the opportunity to listen to our other two speakers so thank you for that and um, something I'd seen in the questions which I think works quite well if you have a question for a specific speaker do start your question with their name that makes it a lot easier for them to spot the question and answer it directly so with that I would now like to I would now like I'm going to hand over to Barbara Schleihagen now Barbara Schleihagen is the executive director of the German Library Association the Bibliotheksverband 
and she's been leading and the association has been leading some really interesting work promoting legally based e-lending in Germany with some success. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Barbara. Thank you very much, Stephen. And um, good afternoon. Hello from very sunny, warm Berlin in Germany. Um, I would like to thank first the Knowledge um, Rights 21 program for organizing this event and for inviting me to give you an insight on what we have been doing um, for public libraries um, with concerns to ebooks. So I'm concentrating today on um, the public library side. It's not because we do not have any problems in academic libraries, it's more or less the same as um, anywhere else, uh, but we needed to concentrate trade and we found that this issue is more pressing at the moment for us. So I will do some screen sharing now. I hope this is visible now for you. That's fine. Yes. Great, thank you. So before I start to give you some more information on um, what is happening um, in our campaign, I would like to give you some context because I think this is important to understand the specific of our system. So Big Germany, 83 million inhabitants, and only about 30% currently use public libraries, so there is room for improvement. We have something like 6.44 million library card holders, and of course we know um, families sometimes just use one card. And a very specific feature for Germany is that we have about 2,000 public libraries, which are led by professionals, but we also have about 5,000 public libraries, which are led either by volunteers or by part-time staff. Um, and those are libraries which are very often supported either by the church or by the communities, but I think this is very specific. And you can see that almost, almost all, kind of, almost 300 not, but almost all um, professional lab libraries, they offer e-lending, but of those which are run by volunteers, it's only every 10th library. And then we have another figure, the active accounts for e-lending. Um, on the one hand, um, the aggregator, the main one, which is working in Germany, um, he says uh, it's 1.3 million, um, whereas Market Consumer Institute uh, GFK, which is growth from knowledge, um, they claim it's 4.4. That this would mean that actually each account is used by four people, which is not very likely. And just to give you another figure, ebook buyers we know is a little bit less than 4 million. So just to give you here the idea of um, the numbers. About the German Library Association, we are pretty old, founded in 4049, and we have about 2,000 members, um, only libraries. Um, we are an institutional membership, and it's libraries of all kinds. It's public libraries, academic libraries, special libraries, it's also libraries in prisons, in hospitals, all kinds of libraries. But, and this is kind of the limitation, they have to be run by professional staff. But as we have also other institutions among our uh, members that actually represent the interests also of these voluntarily led libraries, we claim that we represent the interest of all our libraries in Germany, which is about 9,000, 225,000 staff members and roughly 11 million users. Our main concern is to threaten our libraries to ensure the free access to information for all people. Yet another number to give you a little bit of the context. Um, we have about 109 million physical media which are borrowed annually and about 4.6 million eBooks. So it's a pretty small number. And even in the pandemic where the borrowing of printed books fell sharply as in every country from 340 to 223, eBooks were borrowed um, only about 14% of the total borrowing, um, the number about 30 million. The model which is behind this uh, ebook lending is the one copy, one loan, um, which was also actually um, talked about in the EU um, a court uh, decision of 200, uh, 2016 that Stephen mentioned earlier. So we are following this model. 
So we saw that about 2,000 public libraries are offering e-lending to their users. And we have, on the other hand, about 7,200 publishers that are offer licenses. And here's one specific feature of Germany. The public libraries here, they do not directly negotiate with publishers. And they have no direct license agreement with the publishers. Instead, we are using two aggregators. One for a long time already, since 2007, which is DBBIP, and you might have heard the term online. And another one, um, probably also well known to you from the Anglo-American context, Overdrive, with a service called Libby, um, which is growing now here also in Germany. Um, they provide for the technical platform, for the support, and they are the ones who negotiate the licensing contracts. For the library use of this all, is not visible at all, the access their library and their individual library website, and there they get their ebooks. And we have another specific feature here. We have a remuneration system for right holders for the print environment. So the public library is able, as soon as a publication comes onto the market, they are able to buy it. Um, and the right holder, the author and publisher is remunerated by public library screen. And here's something very important as well. Uh, this remuneration is not paid by the library, but it's paid by our governments, by the 16 federal lender and the national government. And the whole sum, which is currently about 40 million, this is distributed by a collecting society, the VOD, um, and it's the basis of a random sample. And by pure calculation, you come up with each loan means 4.3 cent for the author. But this only applies to the physical environment because it's based on the regulation as we have it at the moment in our copyright legislation. So in our copyright, it says that libraries have this statutory right to choose from all physical works available on the market as soon as it's published, buy and to lend them. And since 50 years now, authors and publishers actually get was in addition to the purchase price, a remuneration for each loan, the so-called library royalty paid by the government. The problem we face in public libraries in Germany is no longer a very high price. This was also a big problem in, in recent years, but it's now something like 1.5 times um, that we have to pay, which is um, more or less something we can deal with. But the real problem is that new ebooks are not available to libraries for up to 12 months. And we illustrate this always with a bestseller list. But this appears, of course, not only to bestsellers, it's really for all new releases on the market. And in the bestseller list, we could show about 70% cannot be licensed for up to 12 months. And in addition, I said we have about 7,200 publishers and they license about 500,000 ebooks, but only less than 7% actually are of the publication year 2021. And those less than 7% achieve about 8%, 8.5% of all loans. And the majority actually is much, much older, more than 10 years older sometimes. So many of these seemingly big number of 500,000 ebooks are simply not relevant for library users. So the conflict is libraries on the one hand, they guarantee the right to information from freely accessible resources, no matter in which format, but other than in the print environment, authors and publishers, they feel suddenly endangered by the e-lending and they call it cannibalizing. They vehemently defend the current practices of licenses by which they themselves determine when and under which condition they offer license to a library. And we find this is not acceptable because this really threatens to restrict the fundamental right of freedom of information and libraries are the trustees of this fundamental right. So what we call for, and we call for, for these kind of changes for more than 10 years now, um, we just simply say we need the same conditions for the lending of printed books and ebooks, because what we do is we model the printed environment. We do not use all the possibilities of the new technique, technology developments. We model the printed environment. 
So therefore, we would like to be able to select and license and elan immediately after publication. And of course, and I think this is only fair, the right holders should receive an appropriate remuneration for digital lending as well. This is currently not the case because there is no legal regulation for that. In September 2020, we therefore started a campaign which is called Buch is Buch, or in English, a book is a book. We started this in September 2020 because we used a window of opportunity. Uh, we needed to implement the EU Copyright Directive International Law by June 21. And this was kind of um, a, a moment where we were able, or we hoped to be able, to also include a legal basis for the e-lending in the copyright law. And of course, also a provision for the uh, library royalty uh, to compensate the author. This was the window of opportunity that we used. Here's some elements of our campaign. We had, of course, the logo and the hashtag. Um, we produced a statement um, and we uh, clarified and explained why we need to have a legal regulation for e-landing. We did a lot of media work. This is, I think, a major part of, um, of a, a campaign, and I'll come back to that later on. But we also produced um, material to support our own members when they get in contact with their own members of the national parliaments, so their own constituencies, because these are the member of parliaments that really listens. They listen to their own library. And we needed to involve our members. And we found that this really gives us a lot of visibility. And this is really our members are our strengths. Of course, we had also some background information on our website. And at one specific moment, we also published an open letter. We decided that by that time, we only wanted to have it signed by library directors. We didn't want to escalate at that moment. But we found more than 1,000 library directors who signed this. And we, we forwarded it to the National Parliament and said, here's an issue that is really important for all libraries in Germany. And we had meetings with publishers, we had meetings with the authors' associations, we had some meetings with the members of parliament and with the government. So I come back to the communication. As I said, communication really is key. We, of course, have our website, but we also use a lot of our social media channels and we are using Twitter, Facebook and Insta. We have a newsletter, which is um, at the moment, I think, sent to about 3,500 people. And we have our internal information system by which we can very easily, via email, um, reach out to our members. Our proactive media work actually led to about 90 articles on e-lending. And this was published in a very short time, September to November, about, about a year, and really included the major journals and newspapers in Germany and also television, radio. Also, our members actually use the logo. You see, as a website of one of our public libraries, um, and they made sure that our also library users know about the issue. In March, we had our first success. Um, in the course of the consultation phase of the implementation of the EU directive, our federal council, which is one of the three bodies which is involved, they suggested a new paragraph. And this read for us quite nicely. Um, and they actually said that at the moment when um, work is published as a digital publication and it's available on the market, the publisher is obliged to grant a non-commercial library the right of use on reasonable terms and conditions. And this, of course, also means that the library has the right to make one copy of the work digitally available to one person at a time for a limited period. So we thought this is very, very good. And we called the members of parliament to take up this initiative from the federal council and to implement this additional paragraph into law. Unfortunately, in June, the federal parliament passed the new copyright legislation without a legal regulation for e-lending. We were not the only ones who talked to the parliament. Again, a new opportunity came up in June. Um, we sent our election touchstones to all political party, including a question on e-lending because we had in September last year, national elections. 
When we evaluated the political parties' programs and their answers to our election talk shows, we found that three parties, the SPD, Bündnis 90 Die Grüne, and the FDP, they were all three in favor of a legal regulation on e-lending, and all three won the elections. This led to the publishers and the authors' counter campaign. They called it fair reading. Um, they choose um, very well um, for their promotion, the Frankfurt Book Fair. They created huge media interest, um, but also gave us a good visibility. We called all our members also to contact the authors they know and explain actually the way in which libraries lend ebooks because we realized that this was not known at all. So we created discussion guidelines to uh, give our members again more background information. We met with members of the parliament. We met also with the CEO of the book selling chain because we felt that we need more statistics to when we have some negotiations. And we also met um, with powerful members of the parliament. And we are at the moment in the process where we plan more meetings with our parliamentarians. We got, and we were really grateful for that international support. In October, IFLA actually published this piece of news um, and declared their support to our call for reform. And in March this year, we saw a, a written question from one of our uh, parties in the parliament from the left. They actually asked the government what they plan to do about the e-lending. And the federal government um, end of March uh, stated that the future remuneration structure will play a central role in the dialogue between the stakeholders. Because they found, they are right, that in the end, we all agree that we want to attract the largest possible readership for ebooks. I think this is our common goal. But what is not yet clarified, actually, is how to organize and to finance this access. And I think finance probably here is a key. Only this week, a study was published, which is called Digital Lending and Libraries, um, and it's on the views of the author and the translators. It was commissioned by the Network of Authors' Rights. About 14,000 authors and translators in German-speaking countries were contacted, less than 6% responded, um, and about one quarter of them were best-selling authors. But the results are really stunning. Um, more than 80% do really not know what contracts are negotiated for e-lending, and almost all do not know about the need for a public library to renew a license. We assume that they also have no deep knowledge of the current practice of public libraries and e-lending. They probably do not know about the one copy, one loan model. Almost 95% feel that they are not sufficiently informed by their publishers about the lending and the remuneration scheme. They do not know why they get which money from whom. Although, and this is what we know, aggregators actually they settle their accounts with publishers on a title a title basis. So this information is available for the publisher. In addition, we found that many were not informed how the budget for the library royalties is determined. And I explained to you early on, this is not paid by the libraries, it's paid by the government. 50% do not understand the distribution notices they receive when they get some money from the collecting society. And in view of this low level of information, in the end, I'm not sure whether it's surprising or it's not surprising that actually libraries are blamed for the low income of the world. And I think libraries are those institutions which really have less to do with that. We, of course, understand that the Library Association favors a higher library royalty, and we have been calling for this for 10 years. So a good point of this study is that 70% of the authors think that it's basically good that ebooks can be borrowed in public libraries, and 80% have also made this possible in the publishing contracts. So this is really a very good basis for further talks. So we call upon the authors and the publishers that they leave their propaganda mode and that they get back to serious exchange of fact-based views and to get acquainted with the remuneration system, to get acquainted with the e-lending lend model used in public libraries. And we call upon the government together with them to ensure fair conditions for authors and publishers. 
we call upon the government to introduce a legal basis for e-lending into copyright law to ensure fair conditions for all, just as in the printed environment. We will never accept the arbitrary access restriction that we see at the moment to electronic works operated by the publishers, as these restrict the fundamental right of freedom of information, and libraries regard themselves as trustees for that right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Barb, and, and for such a, a powerful closing message. I'm going to refresh my video there. That, that was excellent. I think it was some really, especially that research into actually the degree to which our authors who we know are strongly recruited by their collecting societies and their publishers into campaigns, how in fact it would be great if the same effort was put into actually informing them about what was going on as into recruiting them to shout in newspapers. So that's a really welcome thing. And I think there's also that point which I know it's made clear within the, the, the Knowledge Rights 21 position paper, extending e-lending is also a case of extending e-public lending rights. But no, this is a case of actually bringing back the sort of fairness, the equilibrium that's existed in the, in the physical world. I, I, there are a few questions that are directed at you and they've helpfully got your name at the beginning of them in the Q&A box. Um, I don't know, Barbie, do you, do you want to look through? I can read them out, which do you prefer? I will just uh, look through this here. Go for it. To see. Um, okay. <laughs> Whether I have any idea uh, why German politics um, have ignored this issue for so long. Ten years seems a very long campaign for nobody to listen to your plea. Um, yes, that's right. Um, actually, the federal government had this already twice in their terms um, that they, they promised that they would uh, look at the issue of um, e-lending and to make better conditions for the reader. But I found that they found it so difficult to find a solution which is fair to all sides. Because, of course, we know copyright is always looking at a balance and we need to have a new balance here as well. So they listened to all sides and I found it very, very difficult to find a solution. Um, I understand that it's not easy. Especially, I'm not a lawyer, especially, you know, to frame this uh, in a way so that you can improve um, the legislation is certainly a challenge. And I know that there are several ways, um, several suggestions to, um, to answer these questions. But nevertheless, I think we have experts and by now we have enough knowledge, at least among the government, um, to be able to solve this problem. And I think it's important. I think that what became clear is it's visible that there are many stakeholders here. It's not just the libraries and the publishers. It's also the authors, the collecting society. Um, it's probably the booksellers as well. Um, so we need to be back at the table to talk. And I think this is the important thing here. Subscription-based, um, his question, is growing importance of subscription-based streaming services so, so digital books somehow visible in Germany? If so, does it affect the question of e-landing? Um, we do not actually have um, digital, um, we have streaming for filming um, and we have other questions here which are unsolved. Um, but this subscription-based streaming service for so digital books, um, it's not something we do in libraries. Um, so. I don't think that this will affect in, at the moment the question of, of e-lending. There's another question of what the, whether the aims of the public library sector aligns well with the academic library aims or whether they can be sometimes in conflict and if so, which is the priority? Um, I do not think that they're in conflict. Um, they're really kind of two separate worlds, I would say. I mean, academic libraries serve a very well-defined audience, um, the researcher and the students. Um, and this is kind of, um, and there's also uh, publishers who are serving this specific audience. So this is kind of a well-defined world in itself. And the problems which are there are somehow different than in the public libraries world. We found in academic libraries, for example, that it's difficult to get a single title. You're always forced to buy a whole bundle to prices which are unbelievable. Um, we have in the public libraries, um, on the other hand, of course, to serve 
the community. Um, and we are talking about um, many, many publishing houses, which are also, of course, interested in selling their ebooks to the consumer. And I think this is here a difference. Uh, no academic actually would think about buying a database that the library actually is subscribing to. Um, but of course, in the, in the world in which libraries, public libraries operate, uh, here, of course, there is um, a real, um, how do you say that? Um, we are talking about the same people who are reading. Um, and we found actually that those people who buy books um, also use the library and those who use the library, they also buy books. Um, they buy, we have statistics for that and it's a survey which was actually commissioned by the book selling um, of, uh, association. Um, and they found that uh, uh, somebody who is using the library actually buys eight times more um, uh, um, than, than the normal reader, so to speak. So there is a difference in, in, um, in these two worlds. Here's another um, question about um, that the survey reveals authors' lack of knowledge with the royalty system uh, for the e-books, where authors ask if they are fully aware of the royalty arrangements for the print resources as well. I wonder if lack of knowledge is for all formats or only for e-type resources. Actually, yes, they were also asked. Um, and they, are, they do not understand what kind of money they get. They do not understand the system as such. At the moment, actually, there is no royalty system for ebooks because this is not yet in our copyright legislation. There is no basis for paying royalties uh, for the ebook. So it's very obvious that authors do not understand the remuneration system um, of the print environment. And when we realize this lack of information and knowledge, we realize that this probably, if we are able to give the answers here and to ensure that uh, authors know um, what is happening, that we probably can much easier move forward. Because in the end, 80% um, said that they are happy with public libraries lending ebooks. So they support libraries. They think libraries are a good thing. They're just worried just they are worried that they do not get enough um, money out of the of the e-lending. And this is, uh, I think, a fear that we can, at the moment, tackle much, much better because we know where the, uh, where the leg is. So maybe I'll leave it um, with that at the moment. Thank you. Yes. Thank and, you. And, and as I said, um, if further questions come in for Barbara, they'll appear in the Q&A session. Barbara may be able to respond in writing. And we should have some time at the end. But as Barbara said, I'd like now to hand over to Ben, um, who's already up there. So um, Ben will be talking to us. And Ben is the chair of LIBA, the European Association of Research Library, Libraries, their Copyright and Legal Matters Working Group, and is a researcher at Bournemouth University's Centre for Intellectual Property Policy and Management. And he's going to be talking about legal solutions to the ebook dilemma, enabling libraries to act as libraries. So over to you, Ben. Thank you very much, Stephen. Can I just check that you can see the presentation? Yes, full screen. Great. That's good. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me today. And my role really is to give a policy and legal, uh, I guess, summary of, of, of what we've heard. Um, we've discussed today some of the commonalities between public libraries and research libraries. Um, and of course, there are also differences. But I think, I think from uh, my perspective, from a policy perspective, some of those differences are, 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 are not so important. And certainly from a legal perspective at the European level, the law does not really differentiate between uh, public libraries, research libraries, um, and indeed national libraries. So, so any sort of legal uh, response to this, which um, is, is what I will be moving on to, will, will probably at the European level not go into, into the specificities of, of different library types. So I think taking a step back, what are, what are the, role, the basic functions of libraries? They're to acquire material, uh, collection development is a term that we use in English. You acquire material, you, you develop your collection in response to the type of user that you have. So, 
for example, a, a, a university that focuses on science and technical matters is going to have different collections to an arts university. And, and certainly an inner city library will no doubt have very different collections in public libraries to those in, in, in rural areas. So once you've acquired material, you've built your, your collection, then it's about access. And, and that isn't just about your library and you. It's also very, very importantly, it's about interlibrary loan. Um, and, and that is, again, a, a theme that runs through public libraries, as well as, of course, research libraries and national libraries. And, and we, you know, we know for from Germany, for example, that consortia have found it impossible to get ebook licenses that allow interlibrary loan. And then finally, the third societal function is to preserve uh, your, your collection, which may not happen so much in, in public libraries and is more of a research library thing. So, so I think one of the things that we have to think about here is, is the huge imbalance in, in the marketplace. You know, this is not a free market. Libraries essentially have to buy books. Intellectual property creates monopolies, so often there is no substitute to, to the books that you, you, you want. And, and therefore, this leads to uh, contracts and licenses, which are imbalanced, which is what we've heard from, from Cahal as, as well as Barbara. And actually, li listening to Barbara's great presentation, um, I, it was really interesting to see that uh, I think 85% of authors supported public libraries uh, um, licensing their ebooks. There's, of course, a huge imbalance of power between the author and the publisher. So, although it's good that authors uh, think this, I'm not sure in terms of the 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 the, the imbalances and, and where the power actually sits, that that is, is actually, at the end of the day, going to make that much of a difference in terms of politics and strategy around this. So, so what we've heard today is refusal to license Hachette, Amazon, um, refusal to license within the first you know, year or so, as Barbara said, refusal to engage with consortia. So, so publishers might license an ebook to an individual library but for example in the national health service in the uk certain publishers are refusing to deal with with consortia and will only license direct refusal to allow interlibrary loan we've heard about bundling of titles as a thing you can't just buy one title you have to buy a, a, a swathe of titles and that's common a, across public libraries and university libraries. High prices we've heard a lot about and um, exploding licenses as, as Cahal uh, referred to them. You can subscribe and it's there one day and then the next day either your license has ended and you have to buy again or actually the title has just been um, swapped out and you, you knew not, nothing about it. So what, what's this got to do with copyright law? And what I'm talking about today is in large part the e-book uh, position statement that Knowledge Rights 21 launched yesterday. I've put, I've put the link in, in the chat to that and also in my last slide, you'll see that. So copyright really runs through all of this. So uh, legal theory, jurisprudence tells us that copyright acts as an incentive to write. Um, then libraries in the analog world are able to acquire a physical item because the right of the author, once the, the book has been sold, um, in, in many senses is exhausted. In, in America, it's called the first sale doctrine. So, so, so for paper books, this is why libraries can acquire books that are sold, for example, primarily aimed at consumers. Libraries can lend, and in Europe, this is an exception to copyright law, and they can preserve, again, an exception. And as Barbara said, um, we have this thing in Europe called the public lending right, which is different in different European countries. But uh, I think the, the basis is, in most European countries, any loan from a public library will result in a royalty payable to the authors. But this is copyright law. 
and as we've heard, this is irrelevant because actually what, what we're talking about is licenses and contract law. So, so what are the solutions? So um, research funders have um, put a lot of money, not into copyright policy, but into open access policy. So great strides have been made in, in, in the HE sector, particularly around open access articles. Um, we obviously have uh, uh, a movement about open educational resources, ebooks as well, textbooks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I suppose what the issue here is, is about, again, because we're talking about licenses, each license can say something different. So one of the open access terms is gold open access. And this basically means that um, in the main, other than the right of attribution that the author retains, the right for the author's name to be on the work that they've produced, no other rights really, really pertain. So that means that, you know, anyone can make a copy, data mine, share, et cetera, et cetera. So, so open access is a very broad term and obviously gold open access um, provides very, very clear and, and, and broad rights. But I think really the, the area that open access, open educational resources is really gonna have traction is where there are research funders and institutional funders to, to, to allow this. Um, so it's probably limited to certain disciplines within, within academia. Science, obviously the one that comes to mind. So if you know you have gold open access, then this is going to allow these three functions of libraries to acquire, share, and preserve, which is my sort of test on, on these three different solutions that I'm gonna be talking about. So again, open access, hugely important in this debate around eBooks. Um, we've heard Barbara talk about sort of reasonable terms which uh, has been advanced in in Germany and the US and I suppose immediately what comes to mind is again given this imbalance in in negotiating power um, you know who decides what is reasonable uh, we have this this huge differential in 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 power and position one party must purchase the other, does not have to sell and the other sets the pricing because the, the first party essentially often is not in a position not to purchase. So, so, so to me, the question is who actually sets what the reasonable terms are and who arbitrates those reasonable terms if there is a conflict. Um, it, in, in the patent sphere around standards, we have FRAND licensing, and, and essentially that is an obligation to license on fair and reasonable terms. And, and that is really overseen by the competition authorities. So any issues around reasonable terms take many, many, many years to, 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 to solve. Um, and I would also point to the fact that uh, generally as public funded institutions, libraries are generally risk averse. So will they really spend the money to work through many years of arbitration to establish uh, what reasonable terms may or may not actually be? So I think, I think something which I didn't put down here is it, it, a further question mark um, that I have about this is in terms of European law, uh, the, the basis for this, where, where do you look for the basis for these sorts of, of, of terms and conditions? As I said, you can look to the pattern world, but we're talking very, very large industrial players and competition authorities getting involved because they are often monopolies who license these, these standards. So I'm not sure what the sort of legal basis in copyright law would be for this. Um, and I would also point to what I'm going to move on to, which is the 2016 European Court of Justice ruling, um, which, which favoured 
let's call it controlled digital lending. So there is a strong sort of legal basis in, in, in the copyright solution that I'm about to talk about. So Barbara talked about a lot of pushback from the publishers high, using, let's say, arguably the authors who we found out from the research actually don't really understand how ebook licensing works. So we had a public campaign against the Buch is, is Buch, um, Book is Book uh, uh, campaign there. In America, the Association of American Publishers, where we see again reasonable term kind of legislation being on the books of something like seven or eight different states. Um, the Association of American Publishers um, were so incensed by laws that uh, purported to, 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 or attempted to put in place reasonable terms around e-books that, you know, they unreasonably decided to sue the state of Maryland, which has resulted in Maryland sort of pulling back on the reasonable terms legislation um, that, that they have there. There are also other sort of question marks about that, that type of legislation in, in the States, which I won't go into because we're primarily a European audience here. But, but certainly, as in Germany, we've seen in the States even stronger uh, pushback, in, including uh, litigation. So it'll be interesting in the States to see where this reasonable terms type legislation that, as I said, is, 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 is in about seven or eight different states and, and kind of what their response will be to, to Maryland. I think either dropping it entirely or re-evaluating the, the, the construction of, of the law because it may have fallen um, foul of federal copyright law. So again, on my three-prong test, I'm not sure that the reasonable terms actually fulfills any of any of these three core functions or guarantees any of these core functions that libraries have performed for hundreds and hundreds of, of years. So moving on to um, the, the European Court of Justice ruling that Stephen and Barbara referenced earlier on. So this was a case between the Dutch Public Library Association that argued that um, they should be able, under existing European law, to purchase any ebook available, and as they do with paper books, lend that on a one copy, one user basis, subject to the payment of author royalties. So there was a study undertaken by the University of Amsterdam which said no, the Rental and Lending Directive does not allow uh, such an interpretation. So the Dutch government moved to, to legislate a separate body of law and this, and this was then taken to court in the Netherlands and then ultimately ended up at the European Court of Just Justice. And um, I think it, I, I, this is a very, very good quote showing that sometimes if, if you resort to legislation, um, litigation rather, and certainly in the, in the case of the European Court of Justice, which generally seeks to interpret uh, limitations and exceptions to copyright law very, very narrowly, that in this case, that they, they absolutely saw the public interest um, in coming to a reasonable uh, finding, um, a reasonable conclusion. You know, without wishing to overstate its importance, the present case undeniably offers the court a real opportunity to help libraries not only to survive, but to flourish. And essentially what the court ruled was that the, the framework for lending by libraries in, in Europe did not need updating, that libraries should be able to acquire any ebook available on the market and lend that ebook um, in accordance with the numbers of copies that they had purchased. 
again, subject to author payments. So really, really public interest decision that essentially says, we see no dif difference between the digital ebook world and the analog world in terms of public libraries. They should be able, as they have done for millennia, to acquire and to lend. So, so digging down a little bit into the detail, the, 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 the case sort of didn't really envisage, um, so it didn't really env env envisage, I would argue, the, the, the reproduction of analog books, digitizing books, and then lending them using a DRM, a technical protection measure. Um, it was really talking about acquiring eBooks and then and then lending those ebooks but i would argue that the fact that it didn't talk about digitization of paper books for lending as ebooks um, doesn't matter because copyright law european copyright law doesn't make these sort of dis distinctions they're all reproductions so it's very very clear from the case that reproductions are allowable I would also argue that the court, of course, would have been aware that ebooks were subject to licenses aimed at consumers in this case, and therefore the court was fully aware that, like the terms and conditions, the licenses would 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 how can I put it? Um, public libraries purchasing, ripping, lending electronic books would not be allowable by the license court was absolutely aware of that so so again i don't think there is an issue so much with with the contracts um not allowing public libraries to do this the ecj made the clear ruling that libraries should be able to acquire lend pay plr in ebooks in regards to ebooks just as much as they've been able to do with paper books so rejected licenses as as the uh, as the as the the regulatory body of law that um, regulates e lending of e books. Um, it, it said that copyright was very important in, for many for libraries, but also it's good for authors, as as Barbara talked about in terms of PLR particularly. So. So we've also started to hear this term controlled digital lending a lot. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, this is the Knowledge Rights 21 position, this, which reflects the European Court of Justice ruling and actually also reflects IFLA's position on this. Um, so, so essentially, I think what can be envisaged from that ruling is the right to scan in paper books and distribute them also acquire ebooks um, as long as it's on a one copy one user basis clearly reproductions are allowed on the servers technical protection measures like adobe digital editions that the british library has been using for decades allows lending on a one copy one user basis um, and in a sense you know this is what university libraries have been doing in terms of workflow for decades libraries research libraries in particular have been digitizing storing giving access um, through 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 the opac and through other other platforms to their their content so you know in in the university library world this is this has been going on for quite a long time so this ruling this policy position um, creates a stable baseline really for libraries and patrons because it's the baseline that we've known for tens of years hundreds of years it's um authors will not lose out libraries are not purchasing anything for free and library and publishers of course can license on top of such a model um because, you know, for example, let's take the bestsellers, maybe a library doesn't want to do this with the bestsellers, um, 
or maybe it does and it just buys one copy, but actually it wants multiple copies. So it's, it's, it's better to license. This isn't an either, either or, it is creating a safe space, the traditional space, the status quo for libraries in, 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 an, in a digital world. So in terms of my three prong test, uh, the ruling, um, which, as I said, the KR21 position, I think, guarantees collection development. It guarantees access and lending, including interlibrary loan, and it, it, it guarantees preservation. So I guess the $100 million question, $100 million question is, is this, this ruling, is this legal in EU countries? Well, the answer to that is, you know, you're going to have to look at your national law to see whether this might be permissible or not. Um, and at the national level, you do have different differentiations between research libraries, university libraries, national libraries, and, and, and public libraries. So the ruling itself is, is, is a principle established in European law in order to see at the national level whether it's 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 lawful you will have to look at your copyright or or other um other similar bodies of law um and of course it, no no law is perfect so i think risk tolerance you know what is your your risk tolerance for this is is an important question that library directors need to ask themselves. I mean, certainly in the analysis that I've seen or done in the UK and Ireland, I think, I think you can make a much stronger case that this is probably, maybe, you know, uh, could fit under UK and Irish copyright law if you're at a university library. Uh, it's more difficult to see this uh, really operating in, in the UK and Irish law at the moment under, under public and um, for public libraries. So the message here is you've got this great principle in European copyright law, which Knowledge Rights 21 will be advocating for at the national level, as well as the European level in terms of implementation. Um, but at the moment, you're going to have to look at whether this all this ruling stacks up in 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 at national level so that's a lot to take in i'm the last presenter so in any meeting hopefully someone if you're lucky will remember three things um and the three things you need to remember for my presentation is check out the knowledge rights 21 ebook position statement there is a, a link in the chat um Again, another plug for ebook SOS. Um, let's get them over the 5,000 signatory mark as quick as possible. And I would encourage everyone, wherever you are, to um, share information, knowledge, facts, data on social media using the hashtag ebook SOS. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. I think that really cover the ground well and I think it, it sort of it raises that possibility that for others across Europe who are looking to actually come up with a, a better model a better way of doing library lending there may already be the legal provision in place it's just a case of making use of what's there and that's certainly a topic that we'll be looking at through the context throughout the Knowledge Rights 21 program and supporting exactly these sorts of reflections. Now we've got about 12 minutes left I was going to let Ben, if there are a couple of questions that are directly addressed to you, I don't know if you want to answer them directly. Otherwise, I would like to simply ask all of the panelists to, 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 to respond to any additional questions that have come up. I think there's, some, there's been a really active set of questions and answers this time around. And so I'd, I'd prefer that it's the audience questions that get the attention. Otherwise, I, I, I can pick one just for the moment while, while, while others look, just to look at it. There are a couple of times in, in the chat, there's been talk of 
coming up with e-resource platforms or, or working to develop platforms as part of the solution here. Um, do the panelists sort of see coming up with platforms as being, is that a, a replacement for actually working on improvements to the law or is this a complement? Ben? Um, uh, you know, it, it's a, a, a complement, of course, if, if you've heard the issues raised today, um, having a platform doesn't remove most of the licensing issues that, that we've heard around pricing, interlibrary loan, refusal to license, bundling, that none, none of those issues go away simply by having your own platform. Having your own platform will, will create an, a nicer user experience, I, I would say, but it, it doesn't really address, I think, some of the, the fundamental issues that we've been hearing today, which, which are, are based in the unequal relationship, um, the imbalance of power between libraries and publishers. So were there other questions down there, Ben, that you wanted to approach? Otherwise, I'll... Sorry, I thought we were all answering now. I didn't... Well, I, 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 was, I was giving you a sort of a couple of minutes to respond questions directly addressed to you. Uh, okay. Otherwise, I will encourage Barbara and Kahal to, if you can turn on your cameras again, and if you want to respond to anything or make any comments. I think just to start us off, that there was one question, um, which I'll, I'll read out. It's sort of there's some really useful context in here from someone who comes from an academic library where the university librarian comes from the commercial world and who is a librarian by training. And they know that equitable knowledge for all is not on his radar, whereas paying for a subscription service, be it e-textbooks, database, does seem to be a perfectly acceptable activity. Perpetual access rights, permanent access or ownership of e-books is not the cause of concern at all for him. How would you recommend framing this current e-books dilemma, this current e-books debate, two people like that, how to set out, how to explain why this matters. Well, I, I might uh, have a go with that, if that's okay, Stephen, and if Please. Hopefully Ben and Barbara jump in if you want to make some points as well. I think one of the things, first of all, is, and I obviously don't know the, the, all the circumstances of, of that uh, delegate's question, but uh, certainly in most European countries, there's going to be a significant element of government funding involved here, and you've got to ask about taxpayer value if uh, these resources are just simply uh, rented and so on. Uh, then a, there is also the whole collection development piece, which I think has been well covered. And you know, that piece, I guess, again, depends on the, on the uh, disciplinary mix within the institution of um, how difficult it is to anticipate the research uh, objectives and research uh, strategies of different disciplines and departments and what the content and collection required support that is, and a real problem with the um, uh, subscription approach and so on, is that essentially your control over that and your ability to have that kind of um, uh, you know, breadth and depth is really reduced. So there are all sorts of arguments, you know, if you step back from the ideological capitalist approach, if you like to uh, what you might, might be more profitable and so on, there are all sort of sound pedagogical arguments and so on that really would make that, you know, that be certainly being an exclusive approach far from, far from ideal. So I think there there would be some of the points that I'd make, and you know, to, to someone like that, if they were if they were, all, you know, not having such an issue with the uh, with the with the kind of uh, financial and sort of ideological uh, aspect of it. Um, it being um, injecting a bit of real politic into this um, with. I guess decades of experience of of government affairs at the European level as also the national level. Um, the ebook SOS campaign, and I hope I hope my colleagues there don't mind me saying this. We've had conversations with the competition authorities in in the UK because there are many. You know, there are these are these are poorly functioning markets and many many of the things that we're seeing here are indicative of poorly functioning markets like like bundling refusal to license secrecy so you can't compare prices etc 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 and 
And what the director there immediately said was, this affects science and research. And, and um, although I absolutely love my public library, and certainly in the UK, um, you know, public libraries have had a very hard time, but at the political level, and it will depend, I'm sure, on the country, um, but at the European level, I, I think the strongest argument really that we have is research and science, because then the sort of implications of this reduction in access to knowledge is is far more kind of tangible and and and, and direct and you know being really simplistic about it you can join the dots quite quickly going affects science affects research affects industry um sorry that's a very um um yeah real politic answer to the to the question <laughs> If I may add, um, I think this is a very European Union level answer as well, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm really happy um, that we are working with a government um, that puts the equal participation and the question of education for all and access to information uh, very much at the forefront, and especially now as we see that uh, we are losing so many pupils and students um, due to the pandemic um, they're just lagging behind so much and uh, this is a real concern so um, um, this is also our uh, argument that we are using um, uh, and this is of course then a public library's argument excellent thank you no, no, i think that i think all of those arguments together i i hope that your recalcitrant library director will get the point i think either from the pure point of view of is this, I don't know, how do you manage something when it's unpredictable? Isn't it better to actually have greater predictability, but also simply, yes, that contribution to wider social benefits, to wider economic growth. Are there any other questions that any of our presenters wanted to pick up on? I think we've got time for one more, and then I'll do some very brief closing. Yes, there's one, I don't know, the, 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 there's one final one which has appeared very recently about if funds and resources are available to spend on the area of the ebook crisis, where would they be most usefully directed? If that's possible to answer in a couple of, in a couple of sentences and then I'll close. Again, I'm happy to jump in first if that's okay. I, I would actually I'd be cheeky and say, can I talk about two things? Because I think there's two levels really. Uh, I think awareness is still a big issue, you know, that uh, particularly a lot of decision makers and policymakers aren't aware of this. And I think what Barbara might have mentioned that often libraries are actually blamed for not supplying these things. You know, if I can get whatever the thing is on my Kindle, why can't I get it in the library and so on? And not understanding those differences and assuming that's something the library isn't doing. So awareness is a big issue. So some, some, some something some investment in that but then obviously most importantly i think would be um activity which of course knowledge rights is all about at the at the uh, european level in terms of lobbying for this kind of change and to have the uh the 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 research the data and then the um uh targeted access to the to the decision makers to uh to to, to progress those arguments yeah so, so i think there's two sides of the coin sort of the public facing part around awareness and then the sort of um political decision-making part on the other side. I think investment in both is going to be really important. Would you like to add anything to that, Ben or Barbara? Or? No, it sounded good to me. Invest in government affairs and policy and and, and data is, is, is hugely important. Um, so I was really interested to see Barbara's study that, 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 that's just come out. I, I also do think that it's really important, as, as has happened in Germany, that we try, and it's, this is a very complex area, we try to get 
understanding amongst publishers and and authors that um about how how this all adds adds up and the fact that libraries are not are not wanting to to undermine the status quo uh around author access and authors being able to sell um their books and titles all we're arguing is uh the status quo which they've been perfectly happy with so so i think exploring unpicking the we're just asking for what we've done for decades hundreds of years why are authors now now vehemently against seemingly what what, what we've been doing for for hundreds of years when all the studies that I'm ever, ever aware of suggest that authors are hugely supportive of public libraries. So there's something there, I think, as well. Yeah, maybe uh, we can see here also that this information is really, really uh, a crucial factor. And uh, I think that we should really go back to um, fact-based um, talking to each other and I hope that in this way we come up with a creative solution that really fits everybody um, even and I, I now see that reasonable terms is really a difficult term but nevertheless a solution that really would take the interest of all parties of all stakeholders um, concerned um, into account. I, I think I know that that's a, a great way of concluding things I think as I said earlier on so often debate around ebooks around copyright in general is driven by philosophy by ideology by emotion too often this is an evidence-free zone and so this drive some of the progress that's actually really starting to be made in the last few years to understand what's really going on and what really are the the, the, the impacts of like e-lending how much from advantage how much of a bonus it can be in the shorter term the longer term this has that possibility to be transformational and i think um there's a lovely question actually in the chat from, from talking about, are we potentially on the cusp of something new? Are we actually, have we now got to critical mass where we may actually see real changes happening? That's certainly what we're looking and hoping to do. Um, in terms of action points, we're slightly over time. Um, I think as Ben said, do sign up for that ebook SOS campaign. It'd be great to get them over 5,000. I, I don't know if the people behind it are, are watching to see we don't have a live counter on how many signatures but hopefully they get up there as quick as possible and can really have that impact do keep an eye on the knowledge rights 21 website we have the um we have there was a um do look keep an eye on the knowledge rights 21 website we have the uh, we will have the recording of this webinar up there we'll have the links to the additional resources that have been shared and we'll also have information about the opportunities that are there to engage. So with that, I want to thank our speakers, Kahal, Barbara, Ben. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your insights. Thank you to everyone who's joined us for your questions, for your suggestions. And please keep in touch and we look forward to working with you to make a difference, to make sure we do have copyright laws and policies that really do provide for 21st century access to knowledge, research and culture. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks very much.